everyone. Uh, welcome back to the um, mind map coverage of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, so far, um, you would have gone through a bit about the background, the events historically which led up to the um, to the tensions becoming worse between the two sides, between the US and Cuba, as well as uh, we learned a bit more about the tensions themselves. Okay, so now we'll be looking at the events of the crisis themselves. All right, um, just a bit of a heads up, you know that um, there's a lot of stuff here, okay, but um, rest assured, okay, don't be so alarmed. It's not so important that you memorize or know every single event in sequence and all of that. That's what we're going through now. But really what is key is that you have a good understanding, appreciation of what happened in general, okay, um, especially in the context of the Cold War. Remember that the Cuban Missile Crisis did not take place independently but it is one of the main events and um, one of the main events of the larger cold war conflict between um, the u.s and its allies on the one side and then the soviet union and its allies one of which of course was cuba okay so it's important um, not so much to know every single thing that happened during the crisis itself but rather pay attention to who was responsible for what and what what actions were taken which made um, the crisis take place and what made um, the tensions between the two sides worse and what eventually led to the crisis being resolved and the reasons for it, okay? So anyway, uh, let's, without further ado, let's get started. So the Cuban Missile Crisis itself, okay, excuse me, let me just my, minimize that, okay? We can look at it in four different sections, okay? Um, firstly, let's look at the deployment of missiles in the be in to, um, to begin with, okay? So looking at the deployment of missiles, Okay, firstly, what was it that happened? So what is the event itself? Okay, basically, you can see that um, from what you have covered earlier, okay, um, eventually it resulted in um, a formal alliance um, which was formed between Cuba and the Soviet Union. Remember, these two countries were allies in terms of their ideology and the Soviet Union basically took Cuba under its wing. All right, and so um, in line with this alliance, <coughs> excuse me, okay, Castro, Fidel Castro, the leader of Cuba, he wanted to secure public defense, uh, secure a public defense treaty between the two countries. In other words, he wanted to make it public that, um, that uh, the USSR, Soviet Union, would defend Cuba, okay? And this was meant to be a deterrent against a possible American attack on Cuba, okay? In other words, Castro wanted to establish his friendship with the Soviet Union so that the US would be too would be too daunted, okay, they would feel like Cuba is well protected by the Soviet Union and therefore would not ever want to attack Cuba, remembering that Cuba was basically at the US's doorstep. Okay, so this was quite substantial, this is what Castro wanted, but basically Khrushchev wanted to go even further. What did he want to do? He proposed installing nuclear missiles in Cuba, okay, which was not originally what Castro had in mind. Okay, why did he want to do this, okay? And, uh, sorry, and how was this to be done? He wanted this to be done in secret. Why in secret? Okay, so that it, by the time it was found out, it would be too late for the US to object to or even to prevent it. All right? Okay, so moving back. Okay, so as a result of this, okay, Soviet troops started arriving in Cuba. Okay, after this alliance was formed and um, Khrushchev made his intentions clear of wanting nuclear weapons. So 4th October 1962, the first nuclear weapons parts arrived, okay, and the construction of missile launch sites and the military bases began. Okay, what were the reasons for this deployment and this alliance? Okay, basically, why did Khrushchev basically propose this in the first place? Okay, for a couple of reasons. Politically, okay, he felt that it could serve as leverage. Basically, you give him influence eventually to demand West Berlin's integration into East Germany. Remember, at this time, West Berlin was occupied by um, um, a, a US-friendly side, okay, but it was a city totally surrounded by East Germany. This is what you can see here, the context, okay. It was a West German city totally surrounded by East Germany, and this was something which um, the Soviet Union couldn't stand. If you recall from early on, you learned about the Berlin blockade and how much um, it was... Uh, they wanted Berlin, West Berlin, to form part of East Germany. But up to now, okay, 1962, which is uh, more than a, uh, more than 10 years after the Berlin blockade had taken place, still it was part of, um, it was still not part of East Germany. And so this was something they wanted to do in order to 
influence to you know demand. You see, now we have missiles here. You must listen to us. Okay, let us make West Berlin part of East Germany. Okay. Secondly, all right. Um, Castro wanted to increase his prestige among the communist bloc. Now, what's the context behind this? Basically, um, China, which was also a communist country and also a rather major power, its relations with the Soviet Union had deteriorated. Okay, resulting in the Sino-Soviet split of 1961. Okay, whereby China openly disagreed with or denounced the Soviet Union's interpretation of communism. Okay, and so while previously Khrushchev or the Soviet Union was seen to be the leader of the communist bloc, now China challenged Khrushchev's leadership. So this was a bit of a um, an embarrassment for Khrushchev, and he wanted to write this by, okay, showing his power by putting missiles in Cuba. Okay, and successfully defend it so that this would once again increase his prestige among the communist bloc. Okay, now militarily, what reasons did um, Khrushchev have for wanting to put missiles in Cuba? Okay, for a start, this would narrow the missile gap between the USA and the Soviet Union. What does this mean and why? Okay, basically in terms of missile quality, the thing was that American missiles were generally much more effective than Soviet missiles. Okay, and most Soviet missiles could not reach, excuse me, could not reach the USA from the launch sites within the Soviet Union. So now, with the missiles in Cuba, okay, um, things could change. Okay, if you just let me show you this for a while, hold on. Okay, so you can see here. Oops, let me. Uh, can you see? Yes, you can. Okay, so here, Cuba. Now, if you put Soviet missiles in Cuba, they will be able to reach many different parts of the. US, where, whereas previously the Soviet missiles, which were in the Soviet Union, which were all the way here, okay, beyond the screen here, okay, they could not reach the so um, could not reach the USA. So now, the US, um, USSR or Soviet Union, hope for an advantage by placing these missiles in the USA. All right. Now, um, another reason. Okay, another military reason for Khrushchev this wanting to do this was so that he could counter the threat of American Jupiter missile station in Turkey. Okay, um, so these were basically American nuclear missiles which were in Turkey. Turkey, okay, and why, why did he want to counter this threat, sorry? Okay, in terms of geographical proximity, what this means was that basically these Jupiter missiles in Turkey were within striking distance of the Soviet Union. And so these would have threatened the Soviet Union security. Okay, and so Soviet Union felt a bit uneasy because while um, these Jupiter missiles in Turkey could reach the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union itself okay, never had a missile base that was geographically close to the USA. Of course, until, like what I said earlier, they had now the situation where Cuba became communist and now they had the opportunity to put missiles in Cuba which could reach the USA. So this was something which, in a sense, they were looking forward to so as to um, basically make the Soviet Union on par with the US once more. Okay. Linked to this, it also would serve as a more effective deterrent against the USA. Again, why? Okay, because again, geographical proximity. The missile station in Cuba, they could repel any advancing US naval missiles and strike American cities. So once again, if you look here, okay, missiles in here could prevent any possible American threats. Let's say if there were to be any Navy ships which come down the sea and head towards here, towards Cuba, they would be deterred and repelled by possible nuclear missile or even any military launches from Cuba. All right. So this was Khrushchev's. Re these were Khrushchev's reasons for agreeing, wanting this. How about Castro's reasons for agreeing to Khrushchev, Khrushchev's proposal? Basically, as to do with security. All right. It would guarantee Soviet protection of Cuba, as well as boost Cuba's defense. What is the context behind this? Okay. Um, there were previous American actions against the communist government in Cuba. Now, the communist government in Cuba is very new, as you would have learned from the previous section. Yet, already the U.S. had made attempts to get rid of it. Okay, there was, of course, was the failed Bay of Pigs invasion, okay, which convinced Castro that the U.S. would soon launch a full-scale invasion of Cuba. He was a bit paranoid in this sense, and so he felt that if missiles could be placed in Cuba by the Soviet Union, this would deter any possible future American invasion. Okay, there also was Operation Mongoose. 
example, right? Um, which is basically American attempts to undermine or to weaken the so um weaken Cuba, such as through assassination attempts of Castro. Okay, they may all have failed, but basically, um, this was something which put Castro, um, not at ease. Okay, he wasn't at easy. He did not feel at ease as a result of this. Okay, and he believed the Cu uh, Cubans, Cuba had a right to defend itself themselves from such foreign aggression. Therefore, he was welcoming of the missiles. Okay, so this is basically the part on missile deployment. We now move on to the section on US action. So basically, what, how did the US find out about this missile deployment and how did they react to it? Alright, so, excuse me, okay, they discovered the missiles. How was this the case? How did this happen? Basically, in 14th October, okay, if you recall from earlier on, it was only 4th October when the first nuclear missile parts arrived. Okay, just 10 days later, there was an American spy plane which took photos of a missile launch site in Cuba. Alright, so just to show you, okay, it basically took photos like this, okay, which showed evidence of nuclear missile sites, um, nuclear missile bases being built in Cuba. Okay, and so um, uh, this was of course something which would be alarming to the US and in 16th October, okay, a big alarm there, okay, exclamation mark, Kennedy received report, the report that the Soviet Union not only had put, started off putting missile sites, but they already had placed several missile, nuclear missile sites in Cuba, okay, which was very alarming for Kennedy. Okay, so you see there the, the bomb, okay, missiles were capable of reaching the USA as what I had shown you earlier on over here, alright? So it was something which was cause of major alarm for Kennedy. So this was something of course which you can expect the US was not too happy about, alright? It's never nice to have missiles in your backyard now, is it? Okay, so what were their, what was their reaction in terms of how they thought? What were their thoughts? They suspected that the Soviet Union had aggressive intentions, okay? Why did they feel this way? Since like what we had mentioned earlier, the missiles were deployed secretly. They only found out about it because of the spy plane and not because of any official declaration by Cuba or by the Soviet Union. And of course, added to that, the missiles were capable of striking the USA, which would um, certainly not be something the US would look forward to. Okay, and so um, since they saw that the Soviet Union had aggressive intentions, okay, this meant that they would, were worried that the Soviet Union was planning a first strike nuclear attack against the USA. In other words, before the USA would start anything, the Soviet Union would start first by launching missiles against the USA. Okay, And they worried that this could end up as a full-scale nuclear war. And of course, they still had memories of the um, atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki less than 20 years before that. Okay, And this is something which they were not entirely too keen on happening to them or the risk that this may happen to them. Okay, this would be something of mutually assured destruction, a case of mutually assured destruction whereby, let's say, depending on who strikes first, even if it's the Soviet Union who strikes first, the US will retaliate with nuclear weapons and in the end, the only thing which is assured, mutually assured, they will assure one other's, each other's destruction, okay, because of the sheer um, scale of that destruction that um, nuclear weapons can cause. Okay, another thought of the US was felt feelings of betrayal, okay, betrayed by Khrushchev. Why? What's the context behind this? Okay, basically, Khrushchev and the Soviet ambassador to the US, which means the Soviet representative to the US, um, he had ensured, they had assured the USA that Soviet military deployment in Cuba, which was what was happening um, earlier on, okay, all of this over here, they had assured the US that any of all of this that was happening was purely for defense purposes, okay? Why did they say this? Because actually, in a sense, it was true, okay? Because they merely wanted to have these missiles, okay, have the Soviet presence in Cuba as a deterrent against an American attack, okay? Because you know that um, the Americans could use their missiles in Europe as well as in Turkey to hit the USSR. So in a sense, they felt it was just something like tit for tat, right? It's a deterrent. They have to make sure that they have a deterrent against American the Americans using their missiles in Europe and Turkey to attack the USSR, okay? And they, in other words, this was something which, it, at least as far as they said, as far as they were concerned, was for defensive purposes. They had no intention of using the missiles to attack the USA, okay? 
So they felt this way. Okay, if in the end they still felt betrayed, and so what they had to consider what possible actions to take. Okay, so Kennedy, together with his senior advisors, the XCOM, they took time to consider how to respond, and they came up with these options. Okay, six options. Now, um, just a disclaimer here: there's no need to memorize all these options. Okay, the key here is for you to understand what the options were, and why. Would they choose certain options rather than others? What were the plus points, minus points, good points, bad points of these? And why was it that they ended up choosing one of these options and not the rest? Okay, And you must understand the motivation behind this was that um, they wanted to ensure that as far as possible, nuclear war would not break out. Okay? So anyway, let's go through these one by one. The first option, possible action, was to do nothing. In other words, ignore the presence of these missiles. Good and bad points, what's the good point of this, okay? This would avoid the possibility of further humiliation after the failed Bay of Pigs invasion. If you recall, this was sponsored by the US and it had failed. And so, if they were to try to do something, okay, possibly they may be further humiliated and it will look very bad on them, okay? So this is why they thought perhaps, you know, maybe we could do nothing. However, bad points, okay? This would allow the missiles to remain. Okay, by, sorry, uh, by allowing the missiles to remain, this would threaten American security and Kennedy's position as president because he would be made to be seen as weak and that is never good for an American president. Okay, and of course, the US security would be threatened. It would also affect American credibility amongst its allies because the allies would think, hey, you see, you're not even bothering to do anything about a nuclear threat at your doorstep. Okay, this would make, they would think that the US was a pushover. Okay, so that was the first option. Second option, to use diplomatic measures such as negotiations. Negotiations, okay, why is this good? Peaceful solution, of course, you know they want peace. Bad, because while they have peaceful negotiations, the Soviets could still continue missile deployment. Okay, so that means that they may not necessarily stop the missile deployment. And secondly, even being willing to negotiate with the Soviets might be seen as a sign of weakness by American allies. So that, this was why, in a sense, it was also considered a no-no. Thirdly, why not just bypass um, Khrushchev and approach Castro directly and ask him to reject the Soviet missiles? Now, uh, there's only a bad point here. What's bad about that? Okay, so it may be good as if you can avoid Khrushchev, but basically, maybe not so much because it probably would not work since American-Cuba relations, US-Cuba relations had broken down significantly and this meant that it would be unlikely that the Cubans would ever trust the USA, at least not at that point in time, and turn their back on the new Soviet ally, right? Remember, the Soviet Union is their ideological ally as compared to the US which had tried very recently to overthrow the communist government and even had made attempts on Castro's life. So, no-brainer there whom the Cubans would rather listen to definitely not the Americans. Okay, so that was the issue with option number three. Option number four, invade Cuba. Ooh, okay, sounds really interesting. Okay, sounds like uh, a good plan maybe in the sense that they would be taking direct action to remove missiles and overthrow Castro, which is what they wanted. Okay, directly they can do that and don't need to um, hum and haw and, you know, take um, all sorts of uh, indirect measures. However, it's bad because it would most likely lead to direct combat with the Soviet forces in Cuba. Okay, this would be bad because um, if there's direct combat, any remaining Soviet missiles in Cuba could be used against the US, right? Which is of course not what the US wanted. Okay, at the same time, this is bad because again, in the context of the Cold War, this may have given the Soviet Union the excuse to attack West Berlin. Since um, the US was causing trouble in Cuba, they would say, okay, since you're doing it there, then we will attack West Berlin. Again, this is not something which the Americans would want. Again, you must understand the context of the Cold War, whereby there's this rivalry. They don't want any side to um, take have the advantage over the other. So um, this may be seen to be a tit-for-tat move, which is why it was not a good idea to invade Cuba. Okay, fifthly, fifth option was to launch an airstrike, okay? Target and destroy the known missile sites. So not invade directly, but just launch an air attack. Positive because... It's not as risky as a full-scale invasion because you don't have your so-called your boots on the ground. You don't actually put troops in Cuba. You just fly over it and launch your attack from there. It's bad though, bad option because it's a possibility that not all missiles would be identified or destroyed. Okay, remember that what the Americans had to work with was 
were pictures like this, which may not necessarily be fully um, telling as to where all the sites were. There may have been some sites which are hidden from view. Okay. So this, again, possibility that not all these missiles will be identified or destroyed. And again, just like earlier on, any remaining Soviet missiles could be used against the USA, which would basically defeat the purpose of the US launching this attack to try and get rid of the missiles if there still are missiles which are used, lingering missiles which are used against the USA. Okay, so here we come to option number six, and I hope you know that this is the option which was chosen. Okay, spoiler alert. Okay, not really. Okay, so they imposed a naval blockade to prevent further importing and deployment of Soviet offensive rep weaponry. In other words, they would prevent missile parts from reaching Cuba. So it's not to get, it's not to attack Cuba, but to prevent the Soviet missile parts from reaching Cuba. Good point. Okay, it could buy the US more time to assess, to figure out the strength of Soviet forces in Cuba. Okay, and in the meantime, while they were buying time, and, and you know, so that they don't have to act too rashly, okay, they could have conduct negotiations with Khrushchev in the meantime. Okay. Why may this not have been so favourable even though they did choose it in the end? It could still be seen as an act of war even though it was not as grave, not as severe, not as harsh as launching an airstrike and definitely not as, as um, harsh as invading Cuba but it still could have been seen as an act of war which could have triggered a full-scale conflict between the USA and the Soviet Union which of course by now you should know is something which both the US and the Soviet Union would have wanted to avoid. Okay. So anyway, these were the options. What was the final decision made? Okay, going over here to the last section of this part. Okay, or last part of this section, whichever you prefer. Okay, the XCOM, which means Soviet, um, excuse me, um, Kennedy and his senior advisors, they decided on the blockade, number six. Okay, and basically, as a part of this, they would only have an airstrike, in other words, not a full-scale invasion, if negotiations broke down. So they would negotiate while having a blockade, okay, so it's a bit of a combination between of six together with two, all right. They will only launch an airstrike, okay, and then five would be launched if negotiations broke down. They would not want to invade Cuba physically using troops, okay, ground troops. And this was implemented, okay, 22nd October 1960. I'm sorry, my mistake here it should be 1962. Okay, 22nd October 1962, um, Kennedy made a nationwide televised address in the USA, okay, whereby he publicly announced the discovery of missiles in Cuba. Okay, um, I'm sure you've seen before, okay, the, and you can find it on YouTube, the video which shows um, when Kennedy made the public address to the US saying that there were missiles in Cuba, as well as his implementation of the blockade, which meant that all ships approaching Cuba would be checked by American naval ships to ensure no more weapons could proceed to Cuba because a lot of these ships coming in from the Soviet Union contained nuclear missile parts which is what um, the Americans wanted to prevent from entering Cuba anymore okay and at the same time you never know what may happen okay American forces also prepared to be activated during were also prepared to be activated during this time all right Okay, so here we go. This is the section on how the Americans responded to the crisis. So, how then did the Soviet Union and the Cubans respond to the American actions? Okay, no prizes for guessing that. This led to the immediate escalation of tensions. In other words, they became, well, the, yeah, the, the relationship between the, the sides got worse, okay, between the USA and Soviet Union and Cuba. The relationship got worse. Okay, why was this the case? Okay, on the part of Khrushchev of the Soviet Union, okay, he condemned. Okay, he he said he said the blockade was the wrong thing to do. He said this was considered as an act of war. Okay, which is uh, basically like what was shown over there as um how yeah a possible reason why this decision would be a bad idea because he still con considered this an act of war against Cuba. <clears throat> Excuse me. He insisted that the Soviet Union would ignore the blockade and assured Cuba that the Soviet Union would not back down from its decision to place missiles in Cuba. Okay, so of, this was what he said publicly, but of course you know that ultimately he still wanted to avoid nuclear war. And these actions may possibly have led to nuclear war. 
Okay, so while he said all this, okay, all this rhetoric, he will also Okay, was cautious. Okay, you see the amber light there. He was cautious not to escalate the crisis further. Okay, so basically, the Soviet forces in Cuba were put on high alert because there was a risk of military intervention at any time, but they were forbidden from using nuclear missiles. All right, he made it clear, don't use the nuclear missiles, at least not at that point in time. And even though there was a second set of orders which were prepared in case hostilities broke out and these orders basically permitted the use of some nuclear weapons, these orders were delayed okay, to prevent the Americans, not to, to prevent basically anything from upsetting the Americans further. Sorry, there's a typo there. Okay? To prevent um, anything from upsetting the Americans any further. Because just in case these orders, that means these, um, yeah, these orders which stated that Yes, maybe we will use the weapons in case the Americans somehow found out about it through their spies or whatever. Okay, they may, of course, they have not responded very favorably. So these orders were delayed. They were not carried out. Okay, they were not um, rallied to the Soviet um, and Cuban military. All right, so that's on Khrushchev's part. How about on Castro's part? Okay, Castro, he was a bit of a harder nut to crack. Okay, he ordered the mobilization of Cuban forces. Okay, around 300,000 were armed. Okay, it's not a small number. Okay, quite a big number. He prepared them for in the event of war. And, okay, quite a dangerous event that that's why the bomb again. On 23rd October, which is just after the um, announcements by Kennedy, that was on the 22nd, okay, he gave a speech publicly declaring his readiness to die fighting. Oh, okay, so that really would have been cause for alarm. Okay, and remember Castro, you can understand why he would do this because ultimately it was his country which was under threat here. Okay, so what was the outcome of this in the end? Okay, the world seemed to have been brought to the brink of a full-scale nuclear war. So, not a very good outlook at this point in time. Okay, and um, really, this was... I, I don't know if you know any of your, um, your older relatives who have been through this time. Okay, at least... Maybe not so much in Asia, but definitely in Europe, in the US, really, people were thinking that that was the end, that that would be it, okay? The world, as they knew it, would be gone. If, because it seemed so close, the nuclear war was so close to breaking out, okay? So, this was basically how the Soviet and Cuban response uh, made the tensions worse, okay? So how then were things resolved, okay? How was this resolution like, okay? Basically, in spite of all of this, okay, negotiations did take place between Kennedy and Khrushchev. So it started off from Khrushchev, okay? Again, in spite of all of the stuff he said here, all the rhetoric and saying that the Soviet Union not break down, uh, back down, sorry, he was really interested and concerned um, and wanted peace. He did not want the war to break out, so he appealed for peace. How did he do so and why? Why? Because even though by installing missiles, if you remember from earlier, he wanted to enhance the security of the Soviet Union and Cuba, which was its communist ally. Instead, it had gone the other way. It made Soviet Union the target of a potential military strike in Cuba as well. In other words, it went against its objectives of ensuring that um, in trying to make Soviet Union and Cuba more peaceful. Instead, it became more likely for conflict to break out. Okay, so what steps did he take? since he was now appealing for peace. 26 October, okay, a few days after the announcement by Kennedy of the blockade, he sent Kennedy a letter offering to withdraw the missiles, okay, and see how urgent he was. Okay, just the day after, he sent another letter suggesting a trade to further developments in his plans. He suggested a trade whereby the Americans would remove the Jupiter missiles in Turkey, the nuclear missiles in Turkey, in exchange for those in Cuba. All right, so a one-for-one one, um, exchange, so to speak, whereby nuclear weapons would be taken away from both sides. How did Kennedy respond to this? <coughs> well, privately, he was relieved that the Soviets were also looking to avoid war because, remember, both sides really did not want war, especially not of the nuclear variety. He was willing to remove Jupiter missiles from Turkey. Why was he willing to do so? Well, basically, these missiles weren't exactly... Um, state-of-the-art, they were not cutting-edge, they were actually pretty much obsolete and unreliable by this point in time. So it wasn't that big of a deal to the US if he were to get rid of them. However, see, caution there, potential issues. This would be opposed by Turkey, 
Okay, of course Turkey would not want this because these missiles in Turkey were defending Turkey. So this would be a threat to Turkey's own security. Uh, by the way, I mean Turkey, the country, uh, in case you're thinking of food. Okay, <clears throat> so anyway, this risk causing risk causing a split in Turkey. Excuse me, a split in NATO. Okay, Turkey was a NATO member. Hope you remember what NATO is. Okay, it's the Defense Alliance of the US and its allies. Okay, so if there's a split in it, this will make the alliance very strong. Okay, another potential issue is that it could make the US look weak because it may seem as if they were bowing to pressure from its enemy. Alright, pressure from the Soviet Union. In the end, what action, what course of action was taken? Kennedy did agree to Khrushchev's proposal, but he wanted the removal of the Turkish missiles to be kept secret. Okay, so this was part of his response. He said, yes, okay, yes, we will remove missiles in Turkey, but we must keep it secret so that these, um, these things will not, uh, will not take place. Okay, so a bit of um, negotiation going on over there. At the same time, there were some obstacles to a peaceful resolution. Okay, why? Because while um, the two sides were negotiating, okay, during this point in time, the situation was still heating up at the ground level. In other words, they were talking up there, but down there, there still was certain uh, tensions and um, things, the situation was not getting any better. Okay, examples of that, okay, the construction of missile sites and the preparation of missile facilities in Cuba continued. In other words, it was still business as usual in Cuba in terms of the building up of the military sites. Castro, of course, we learned, was quite um, animated in his own, in his um, this desire to make sure that Cuba remains safe. Again, okay, the steps he was taking, remember, 300,000, he continued to mobilize his troops and he declared Cuba would open fire on American spy planes. Okay, that's really quite a big deal. All right, and to that end, okay, not by Cuba, by the Soviets, okay, an American spy plane was shot down over Cuba. Okay, and the pilot, in fact, um, was who died was basically the only ever casualty of the Cuban missile crisis at the end of the day. Okay, but anyway, this another American spy plane was shot down. Okay, so these were some obstacles. However, in the end, thankfully for everyone, okay, a deal was reached. Okay, Khrushchev announced his acceptance of the Kennedy's deal on twenty eighth October. Okay, so just uh, thirteen or so days after the crisis had started with the discovery of the missiles in Cuba. Okay, he announced the acceptance of Kennedy's deal. Okay, Soviet missiles were to be withdrawn by Cuba and. Secretly, okay, the US would remove its Jupiter missiles from Turkey. Why was this done? Okay. Because there was a degree of <coughs> cooperation between Kennedy and Khrushchev. Okay. In the US imposition of the blockade, even though it was in one sense seen as an act of war and an aggressive action, it was good in the sense that it gave both leaders time to cool down and prevent any rash decisions from being made. Okay, how apt that today, as I record this, it is cooling down day. But anyway, again, that's besides the point. Okay, it gave both leaders time to cool down. Okay, to not not be ruled by their emotions, but really take time to think first before to think about the consequences of their actions. Whether it's the wise thing to be aggressive fully. Okay, it gave them the time to cool down and prevent any rash decisions from being made. Okay, um, so basically, this facilitated the um. The imposition of the blockade facilitated this cooperation. Okay, now there also was um concern over both leaders over the consequences of nuclear war, which, as you know, was not something anyone would be looking forward to. Okay, they recognized that even a small number of nuclear missiles could cause widespread destruction, and so it was not very in the interest of um, preserving the world and world peace. Putting these nuclear missiles was not a good idea. All right, and Kennedy. Even though he, the U.S. did have a military advantage, he was still unwilling to make use of this military advantage to start a war, okay, which shows how serious um, they felt, how seriously they felt, both Kennedy and Khrushchev felt about nuclear war. Okay, another reason for this cooperation was because <clears throat> they were both cautious over the lack of direct control over their military commanders and these military commanders' aggressive tendencies. In other words, while they were the leaders of it all, they did not have total control over the people who were making, who were taking action on the ground, at least, um, yeah, on in Cuba itself. Okay, for example, some American and Soviet military commanders were extremely confident in their 
own side's military capabilities, okay, and they advocated they supported using military action. In other words, they didn't bother about the possible side effects, the destruction caused by nuclear weapons, and they were advocating supporting military action as the best way to resolve the conflict, okay, which is not exactly um, very much in the interest of peace. Okay, of course, there also was this American spy plane which was shot down. Why was this done? Because a Soviet military commander had acted on his own authority. He didn't seek permission, he just did it. Okay, so again, um, if more people were to take actions like this, this would make the situation much more risky. So it's a very tense situation whereby war may break out any time, not because of what Kennedy or Khrushchev may have wanted, but simply because the people under them take actions, uh, take things into their own hands. Okay, so as a result of this, both leaders were worried about the consequences of letting the crisis drag on. So in other words, the longer it took for them to reach an agreement, the higher chance there would be for more incidents like this to take place, Okay, which may result in um, nuclear war breaking out, even without their approval. Okay, Basically, yeah, like what I said here, any incident out of their control could inflame the situation, make the situation worse, and set off an uncontrollable chain of events. Alright? So, they were willing to negotiate and allow for a face-saving way out. Okay, both Kennedy and Khrushchev, they risked weakening their power if they appeared weak. In other words, they did not seem to be taking decisive action and not letting the enemy get the advantage over them. Okay, why was this the case? Kennedy needed secrecy over the removal of Jupiter missiles in Turkey, while Khrushchev needed the US to promise not to invade Cuba. Okay, so if they didn't get this, okay, they... Both sides, both Kennedy and Khrushchev may have appeared weak, which is not something they wanted, okay? And they basically were both fearful of the consequences of any aggressive action, okay? And this was what also forced them to accommodate each other, rather than saying all these things and really letting it get out of hand into a war, okay? They basically realized that they had to accommodate, in other words, listen to each other, one and each other, and reach a compromise, all right? Now, the last part of this section, I know it's very long, this section, okay? Public and international opinion was also something which contributed to the uh, reason why a deal was reached. Okay, why was this the case? In four ends, okay? In terms of the American public, they were alarmed at the prospect that they could all be killed in a matter of days. Okay, so just to show you a picture, okay? This is a picture of some demonstrations for peace, all right? <coughs> peace or perish. So, of course, they wanted peace. So, the public pressure which Kennedy faced, okay? Um, encouraged him to seek a peaceful solution. <coughs> okay. So they urged, like, like I said, they urged Kennedy to handle the crisis with caution. America's allies, okay, were also in favor of a peaceful resolution. Example, Britain. Okay, even though it publicly supported Kennedy's decision to impose a blockade, yet, privately, okay, it urged USA to take greater caution. Similarly, the Western Europeans, okay, apart from Britain, they had lived within the range of Soviet missiles for years. Okay, this was part of their daily life, and so, the, from their point of view, they thought the U.S. was making a big deal out of nothing because, well, they lived under the, um, the threat of Soviet missiles for a long time, and nothing happened to them. Why is the U.S. Uh, getting it so um, upset and uptight over this? <coughs> Excuse me. So, as a result, okay, Kennedy had to act cautiously to avoid a split in NATO between Western Europe and the USA because remember ultimately Britain and Western Europe are important allies of the USA in NATO so if they took actions which Britain and the other countries in Western Europe were not comfortable with okay this may make this may weaken NATO which is not something they wanted to do okay while American allies were in favor of peace on the other hand Soviet in, in contrast okay Soviet allies went the other way okay Castro he urged Khrushchev to stand firm, and he declared his people willing to die in defense of their homeland. Okay, very dramatic, but this is really how he felt. Okay, um, China also urged Khrushchev to be tough against the USA. Okay, more rhetorical statements. Okay, promised Castro that millions of Chinese were willing to fight for a fellow communist state. Okay, which is not something which someone who wants peace would want to hear. Okay, at least definitely not. This would not be amusing to American ears. Okay. Now, on the, even though countries like um, Cuba and China seem to uh, make things worse, okay, this actually made Khrushchev more fearful of going to war with the USA. Why? Because 
there's a risk of global nuclear war breaking out because even a country like China, which was thousands of miles away, was willing to contribute, apparently. So all the more Khrushchev wanted to take um, steps which would make sure that um, war would not break out. All right? Okay. Finally, international players, that means other countries, um, not other countries, but other um, people who were known globally, okay, such as the UN Secretary General, which means the leader of the UN at that point in time, Yu Tant, okay, as well as the Pope. They acted as mediators between the two sides, urging them to avoid war. In other words, they took actions to try to ensure that there would be peace and not any nuclear war breaking out. Okay, so this, because both the UN Secretary General, Utant, and the Pope were internationally respected. So all the more, if they are pushing for peace, Kennedy and Khrushchev were even more determined to resolve the crisis peacefully and to avoid being seen as warmongers. In other words, people who were advocating fighting. They did not want to be seen in this way. All right. So that's pretty much um, it for this section on the events of the Cuban Missile Crisis. All right, now we'll move on to the last section on the impact of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, this section um, is not as important as, as, in particular, 2 and 3 and even 1, but it is good for you to understand, you know, how the Cuban Missile Crisis had an impact on the Cold War and how, in fact, things like this contributed eventually to the Cold War coming to a close, which is what you will learn in the following chapter. Okay, so please do bear with me as we look at this. Now, in terms of the impact of the Cuban Missile Crisis, we look and see okay, how the impact it had on the individual countries, in particular the Soviet Union, Cuba and the USA. Okay, um, Later on, we'll also look at what steps were taken to achieve nuclear disarmament as a result of the trauma, the, the um, psychological trauma that the Cuban Missile Crisis brought on um, the nuclear powers. And finally, the establishment of a hotline, which we'll get to in a moment. Okay, So let's look at the individual countries' response first. In terms of the USA's response, okay, on the positive side, what was the positive impact of the Cuban Missile Crisis? In terms of Kennedy's reputation, it did improve. Why was this the case? Okay, because he was seen as courageous, okay, because he had stood up to Khrushchev and um, had made Khrushchev back down from installing the missile. So he was seen to be like a really brave guy for doing something like this. He also had stood up to the hardliners, hardliners in his government, basically the military commanders and other people who felt that the USA should go to war, okay, and even be willing to risk nuclear war. Okay, he stood up to them. He did not take more aggressive actions against Cuba and the Soviet Union. So as a result of this, he was seen as courageous. His, in, his reputation did improve. However, on the negative side, okay, his relations with his allies were worsened. Okay, remember, like what we said earlier, some allies like Britain, um, saw that saw the American objection to the Soviet missiles in Cuba as being unreasonable. Okay. okay, why was this the case? Because the USA itself had already installed missiles in Turkey, so they felt it's a bit hypocritical for the US to be um, angry about the Soviets putting missiles in Cuba. Okay, and added to that, many NATO states were upset with the removal of Jupiter missiles in Turkey. Okay, why were they upset? They saw this as the US taking unilateral action. In other words, they did something without consulting them first. So they felt disrespected and they felt angered that the US did not consider their own um, consi did not consider their own situation before doing so. Because remember, these missiles in Turkey would be protecting many of these NATO states in Europe and in Turkey, not to mention in Turkey itself. Okay. Another negative point from this in terms of security concerns, okay, now Cuba was there. They had to come to terms with having a communist country in its own backyard. So if you allow me to go back to the this one, okay, Cuba, which is very near, okay, 234 miles is basically, I don't know, like less than maybe something like between Singapore and Penang, perhaps. Okay, so that's how near a communist enemy was to the U.S., so um, they had to come to terms, they had to learn to accept this, all right? So this was an issue for the U.S. Now, in terms of the Soviet Union, positively, what was the positive impact of that? Okay, Khrushchev's reputation outside the communist bloc. Okay, please take note of this, outside, not inside, because inside was a totally different matter altogether, but outside, okay, by countries even in the Western bloc, so by countries like the U.S., okay, 
His reputation improved because he was seen to be a responsible peacemaker for taking actions to avoid having nuclear war break out. Okay, in terms of security, this also was a plus point for the Soviet Union because, firstly, the threat of Jupiter missiles lows in Turkey was removed. Okay, however, this was kept secret. So, um, the Soviet Union itself and the Communist bloc was not aware of this. Okay, and in in fact, um, neither was the Western bloc. Okay, it was kept secret. Another uh, positive, okay, Cuba remained a communist state, okay, this was good because Cuba would be a valuable ally to the Soviet Union in the Americas, because again, if you look at this, okay, I know it's not a full map of um, North America, but basically this was one communist country, pretty much everything else around it was not, okay, so this was a value, Cuba would be a valuable ally to the Soviet Union in the Americas, okay. And also, this opened up the way for Khrushchev to push for this armament because um, they, 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 were so, um, they came so close to nuclear war, so now Khrushchev had the opportunity to say, hey, you see, we need to disarm. And since the Soviet Union was, um, in terms of nuclear capabilities behind the US, it would be to its advantage if there was a chance for disarmament. Okay, why was this bad, though? Okay, for Khrushchev, Within the communist bloc itself, his reputation suffered. Why? Because many saw him as giving in too much to the USA. Okay? He was too too nice to the Americans, basically. Okay? Made the Soviet Union appear weak. So this weakened Khrushchev's reputation. Okay? Also, with his own allies, the Soviet allies, relations were worsened. Okay? Cuba, remember how Castro was so angry um, with the US and was willing to have all his people die and all that in the sake of defending Cuba. So Cuba felt betrayed by how the crisis was resolved. Okay, why? Because they were not consulted during the negotiations and of course they no longer had nuclear weapons. Okay, China, which if you recall was had a worsening relationship with the US, okay, they ac accused the US, excuse me, accused the so sorry, I meant Soviet Union. So China, which had a worsening relationship with the Soviet Union, already now further accused the Soviet Union of backing down to its enemy, which was um which basically made the leadership of the communist bloc even more shaky. So it wasn't, so Khrushchev's reputation was worsened in this area. Okay, satellite states also had a poor impression of Khrushchev precisely because he seemed, was seen to be too good, too um, friendly and too accommodating to the USA. Right, how about for Cuba? Okay, good things. Okay, Castro's reputation and power were unscathed, in other words, they were not affected, okay, because Castro continued to be seen as a national hero in Cuba. Remember, he was the one who was so, um, yeah, he really wanted to ensure that Cuba did not um, suffer in any way, and um, yeah, this was seen to be to his advantage. Of course, he also remained in power as a result, he didn't lose his power, okay, and he also remained in control of the American companies and economic resources that he had nationalized. Okay, you would have learned about this in the um, in particular in the first and second parts of um, this mind map. Okay, security concerns. This also was good for Cuba. Okay, they were protected from a possible American invasion. All right, so they remain. Cuba remained highly armed to prepare for any possible future U.S. invasion. Even though they may not have had nuclear weapons anymore, but they still remained very capable in that sense, okay, still protected from a possible American invasion. Now, what was, how is this a negative, okay, in terms of the relationship with the USSR, excuse me, I need to say US there, in terms of relationship with the Soviet Union, it got worse, okay, but at least they were still a Soviet ally, so it's not so bad. In terms of security concerns, okay, of course they lost nuclear protection. So here we see the effects, positive and negative for each of these three individual countries. Now, as a result of this, okay, they were so um, the nu um, nuclear war almost broke out. So after this, steps were taken to achieve nuclear disarmament. Why? Again, like I said, they realized how close they had come to a nuclear war, and so they had to take steps to prevent such a situation from ever happening again. All right. And what was the way in which they were to do this? Okay, they wanted to reduce the development of new nuclear weapons. All right. So what measures were taken then? 5th August 63, so less than a year after this whole crisis had resolved, okay, they introduced something called the Limited Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. What did this in 
include, okay? Firstly, it was signed between the US, Soviet Union and Britain, which were the three main, in fact, at that time, the three nuclear-powered countries, uh, sorry, um, countries with nuclear weapons capabilities. Okay, what happened was they banned testing of nuclear weapons except for underground. Okay, so they still could test nuclear weapons underground, but not above ground. Why? It was designed to limit the growing effects of nuclear radiation fallout on the Earth's atmosphere. In other words, the severe poll pollutive effect that um, above ground nuclear weapons testing was having on the atmosphere. So this was the measure which was taken. Limitations of this, yes, there were limitations, of course. Hopes of achieving disarmament were still futile. In other words, not of much use to a large extent because the arms race still continued. Okay? This still was the arms race going on in the context of the Cold War. And in spite of this, nuclear arsenals continue to grow much larger because remember this new limited nuclear test ban treaty is banning nuclear tests, not banning nuclear weapons. So all of this still was an issue. So disarmament was not really carried out. Okay? Both leaders themselves, Kennedy and Khrushchev, did not get to work towards the fulfillment of disarmament. Okay, so these were the two people who were most interested in ensuring that there was disarmament, but both of them didn't get to work towards it. Why? Okay. That the next year, Kennedy was assassinated, okay, by Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, but that's another story, okay. And Khrushchev, okay, is still suffering from the effects, the blow to his reputation as a result of his actions during the Cuban Missile Crisis. He was removed from office and he was soon placed in house arrest. Okay, and he died like in the early seventies. So both of them did not get to play their part in working towards the fulfillment of disarmament. In the end, it was not really. So there were steps taken, but. To a large extent, disarmament was not carried out. Okay. However, another thing which I uh, guess you could say a good thing which came out of it was the establishment of a hotline. What hotline and why? Okay. Why was there this hotline? Okay, because there was a lack of direct and confidential communication between Kennedy and Khrushchev during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and okay, the effect. Uh, sorry, the since there was a lack of such direct and confidential communication communication was done through the media and other unreliable means. Okay, everything which they said had to be reported through the media first, rather than going to them directly. And what's the impact of this? This, okay, contributed to the escalation of the crisis because it made miscommunication and you know, misinterpretation of statements more likely to happen. As a result, it had brought the world to the brink of nuclear war. Okay, so since this communication was an issue, they realized they had to do something about it. Okay, they needed a direct line of communication so that they would really know each other's intentions. Basically, speak to each other as close as possible to being face-to-face -face and not based on what other people say. Right? I'm sure you can imagine. what If you speak directly to someone, you get to know what exactly is going on in a much clearer way than if you were to hear it from someone else. Right? You need the clarification. So what was done? To this end, there was a direct telephone line between the Soviet Union and the USA established, okay? So to make communication much more convenient so that they could avoid having the misunderstandings which may possibly have led to yet another crisis on the scale of the Cuban Missile Crisis, okay? And in this way, this worked because there was no more major... Um, th this was the last time where really nuclear war, at least in the shortly after that, whereby nuclear war was really close to ever having broken out. Okay? Alright, so here we are, we are at the end of this part. Uh, impact of Cuban Missile Crisis and the chapter um, as a whole. Alright, thank you for your patience in going through this. Okay, if you have any further questions, okay, remember for the essay section, you need to be aware, at least not about every single nitty-gritty detail, but you need to be have an understanding of how the Cold War fits into this, okay, and how um, the individual countries really, the actions which they took, which made, ten made things worse and in the end made things better. Okay, you have to be aware of this and understand the role played by each of these countries. Okay, that is especially important for this chapter for the SEQs and of course for the SBQs, you need to be aware of the topic in general so that you can understand your source-based questions well and do them properly, bringing in your own knowledge as far as possible, okay, to score as well as you can for your source base. Okay, so that's it for now, like I was saying earlier, okay, any questions, please don't hesitate to look for Mr. Ong or myself. Alright, thank you and bye-bye. Uh,